He was elected as the leader of the St. Petersburg Soviets, the bodies, the Soviets that arose during the 1905 revolution as mass democratic workers' organisations. After the defeat of 1905, he was forced, along with many other revolutionaries, back into exile. He returned in 1917 after the Tsar, the, milit the brutal dictatorship, had been overthrown, but the working class was not yet in power. And he, like Lenin, clearly understood what was necessary in the months that were ahead, and he fought for them with utter determination. He spoke to the Petrograd Soviet the day after he had returned to Russia, and he said, no trust in the capitalists, control our own leaders, have confidence in our own revolutionary forces. And that one sentence summed up the approach that Trotsky, Lenin and the Bolsheviks took in the coming months, where through all the twists and turns of the revolution, they put forward a program at each stage that pointed the working class towards the conquest of power. He was then imprisoned for a month, and when he was released and the Bolsheviks had taken a majority, he was elected as chair of the Petrograd Soviet. As president of that, uh, or, or as chair of that, he was also president of what was formerly a subcommittee, the militant revolution, the military revolutionary committee, which was key to organizing the insurrection, which took place overwhelmingly peacefully, but which was marked the point at which the working class took the power for the first time in history, the greatest event to have taken place so far in human history. At the time, the centrality of Trotsky's role in those events was seen by all. This is what one participant said. He said, all practical work in connection with the organization of the uprising was done under the immediate direction of Comrade Trotsky. And then he goes on for a few more paragraphs of praising him. That participant was Stalin. In 1918, even Stalin had to recognize the central role that Trotsky was playing. And it wasn't just the revolution. In the aftermath, the weak new workers' state was attacked by 21 capitalist armies determined to crush the growth of socialism. And it was Trotsky that led the fight to build the Red Army from scratch, spent two and a half years traveling across all the different military fronts in an armored train, built an army that was five million strong by the end of 1920. Imagine what that was like. These were workers and poor people who had been through the carnage of the First World War. A central demand of the revolution was for peace. And yet they were immediately faced with this brutal attack by world capitalism and heroically they organized, they fought back and they defeated world imperialism. That's just, if, if that was it, that would be enough to make Trotsky a giant. But of course, there's more. It didn't end there. Lenin and Trotsky saw the Russian Revolution as an overture, the first step in the world socialist revolution. They never imagined it remaining isolated in Russia alone. But unfortunately, poverty-stricken, war-torn Russia was left isolated as a result of the failure of revolutions in other countries and then degenerated. And you had the rise of Stalinism, still based on a planned economy run in the name of the working class, but with power usurped by a brutal dictatorship. To consolidate his regime, Stalin had to create a river of blood that ran between the workers' democracy of 1917 and the brutality of Stalinism. Above all, he had to crush Trotsky and his supporters. Trotsky was forced into exile on a planet without a visa. Thousands of his political co-thinkers in the left opposition were murdered. His two sons were murdered. And then, of course, in 1940, Trotsky himself was murdered by an agent of Stalin. So, no question about the heroism of Trotsky. And it's often the case, when revolutionary heroes die, they become commodified, made respectable, uh, in, 
incorporated by the capitalist class. You can go to major multinational shops in London and buy T-shirts with Che Guevara on the front and beer with Che Guevara on the front and all the rest of it. Never, ever has that happened with Trotsky. On the contrary, when he's mentioned at all, it is still today to attack him. And why is that? It's because the ideas he fought for remain essential for the struggle for socialism in the 21st century. It's not automatic that ideas that were brilliant in the past remain relevant today. But the main analysis of Marx, of Engels, of Lenin and Trotsky remain more relevant today than ever in the struggle for socialism. Trotsky, Trotsky himself rightly saw that his greatest achievements were actually not the practical ones that I've given you a very brief overview of, but the role he played as a theoretician of the world workers' movement, analysing the problems the working class faced, as Sasha has already described in relation to fascism, not from his armchair for the sake of it, but in order to arm the working class in the struggle to overcome those problems. His analysis of Stalinism, what it represented and how it could be defeated, was of gigantic importance in arming not just that generation, but future generations. Without it, Marxists would have been groping in the dark. Trotsky himself made clear that the painstaking political work, involving often relatively small forces, that he did in the last years of his life, was the most important, the most indispensable work, because, as he said, it was arming the new generation with a revolutionary method. Basing ourselves on the ideas and methods of Trotskyism, our international was able to analyse almost alone what the collapse of Stalinism and the return to capitalism meant for Russia. Trotsky had predicted it would mean a catastrophic decline of industry and culture, and that is what happened. But also what it would mean for the whole world, that the capitalists globally were able to go on the offensive against the working class and the ideas of socialism. We saw leaders of the mass parties that had previously paid lip service, it wasn't more than that, but paid lip service to socialism, now being open advocates of neoliberal capitalism in Britain. We have Tony Blair to sum that process up in one word. It's not an exaggeration to say the generation that came to conscious life, if you like, in the 1990s, never heard of socialism other than as something of historical and past interest unless they were lucky enough to come into contact with the CWI or a handful of other socialists on a global basis. But we understood that while socialist ideas had been pushed back, the working class had been pushed back, the fundamental strength of the working class remained intact and the capitalist system was utterly incapable of taking society forward. And therefore, the working class would be forced to struggle, to again look for socialist ideas, and that the possibility would be posed to complete what Lenin, Trotsky and the heroic Russian working class began in 1917 with the socialist transformation of society. It's not just a possibility, it's a necessity. Look what capitalism has to offer today. Mass unemployment, poverty, national oppression, environmental discussion, uh, destruction, and the willingness of the poor and the oppressed, the working class around the world to struggle is absolutely clear. Just look right now what's taking place in Belarus, in the Lebanon, in Chile and elsewhere. Masses of people taking to the streets. We've also seen in the last era the beginnings of a new generation looking for socialist ideas, beginning to rediscover them. That's what Corbyn's being elect, Corbyn being elected as leader of the Labour Party represented in Britain and there were many other similar developments internationally. So the ideas developed by our forebears, with Trotsky in the very first rank, are essential tools for the struggles that are now ahead. You've heard from Siri about the relevance of his theory of permanent revolution that capitalism is incapable of carrying out the tasks of its own revolution, of the capitalist democratic revolution, in many countries of the world, at least not fully or completely. 
and therefore it will fall to the working class as part of the struggle for socialism to achieve that. I was struck watching the British news programme Newsnight on Friday night. I don't know how many of you saw it, but they interviewed young Lebanese activists and they had mixed ideas, but some things were very clear. They understood they could have no trust in the capitalist elites in the Lebanon or globally, and they had to rely on the strength of the mass movement. One of them summed it up. We have been let down by capitalism and sectarianism. That's an indication of a new generation beginning to draw the conclusions of permanent revolution. Capitalism now is in a devastating crisis worldwide. Worse than what we had 10 years ago or slightly over 10 years ago. And of course, the living standards of the working class have not recovered from that crisis. In Europe, as the furlough schemes come to an end, where at the moment the state is paying the wages of 40 million workers in the European Union, as that comes to an end, mass unemployment is going, uh, going uh, to rocket. Here in Britain, the Labour mayor of Manchester, a city in the northwest, has pleaded with the government that they're facing wor the worst homelessness crisis since the 1930s. And please, please, can the Tories do something? He needs to take, he won't, but he needs to take a lesson from our history. The city next door to him in Liverpool, when we were in the leadership in the 1980s, which organised a mass movement and took on and defeated the Tories and therefore was able to build 5,000 council houses to move a long way to overcoming the homelessness crisis. The Tory government in Britain, like many capitalist governments around the world, is extremely weak. We've just had in the last week Six formers, 17 and 18 year olds taking to the streets and defeating the government. It shows what's possible. But unfortunately, the majority of the leaders of the workers movement have not shown a tenth of the determination of the school students. On the contrary, they have drawn the conclusion from the COVID crisis that it means it's not possible to struggle rather than drawing that it makes it more essential to organise a serious, a serious struggle than ever. In Britain, in the Labour Party, we have the victory of the pro-capitalist wing with the election of Keir Starmer. To win, he had to stand on a platform with some left policies. But they included, for example, defending migrants' rights. We currently have children dying in the Channel, refugees struggling to get to Britain, and Starmer has not said one word about it. That's how far he's defending migrants' rights. And don't imagine that he will defend nationalisation of the privatised utilities or the other elements of the Corbyn programme that he stood on anymore. His real intentions have been shown by his ruthless campaign to follow through on the defeat of the Labour left and to remove them from every single position in the Labour Party. It's always thus, when the right backed by the capitalist class are in power, they are ruthless in pursuing their ends. All too often, when the left are in power, as unfortunately Corbyn did, they are defeated because they retreat, they compromise, they try to be nice instead of fighting tenaciously in the interests of the working class. It didn't have to be like that. We put forward a programme to mobilise those infused by Corbyn to transform the Labour Party into a mass workers' party. And now we have to look what next. Len McCluskey, the leader of the biggest affiliated union to the Labour Party, has raised the idea of a gathering to discuss the way forward. And if that involves the fighting elements of the workers' movement inside and outside the Labour Party to discuss the need for working class political representation, that could be an important step forward. In the Socialist Party, we're also campaigning that workers' struggles are going to need an electoral voice. And you're not going to get it from the Blairites in the local council chambers or uh, in Parliament. And therefore, the question of workers standing in elections is again posed. In Britain and in many countries around the world, the working class has no independent voice of its own. And what are the lessons of the uprisings of the last decade, of the Arab Spring back in 2011? It's that heroism and mass movements can bring down dictatorships. 
But to change society, to win a society that operates in the interests of the majority, you need to be organised. You need to have mass parties of the working class. Trotsky fought at every stage for independent working class political representation. He said, for example, in the US in 1938, that the working class needs a party, its own party. This is the first step in its political education. And as we do today, he saw revolutionaries as having a dual role of fighting for the establishment of independent working class political representation, but also organizing around a clear Marxist program and fighting to win the leadership of the working class and its organizations. Because after all, in the Arab Spring, there was an absence of mass parties. But most of the history of the 20th century, there were mass parties that workers looked to in many countries. And it was a history of the leaders of social democracy, the Stalinized communist parties, again and again, betraying the working class and rescuing the capitalist system. Trotsky hammered away at one of the key lessons of his life. In 1917, the working class took power. Afterwards, there were a wave of revolutions in other countries, but the working class was not able to take the power. And what was the difference? It was not a difference in the Russian working class or the scale of the movement. It was the absence of a party of a Bolshevik type. That's what existed. And that's what we have to fight remorselessly to build today. You have heard from Siri, from Peter, about the history of the CWI, of our international, of building serious roots uh, and mass support for Trotskyist ideas, scoring victories against the capitalist class. But that will be our prehistory because of the scale, the tasks that we face now. The work we're doing now is building the framework of a Trotskyist international in order to prepare the ground for the opportunity, the necessity of building mass revolutionary parties capable of leading a successful struggle for socialism in the 21st century.